So Psalm 37, as uh, I uh, yeah, talked about last week, is, is actually read in our liturgies, although um, it's assigned for three different Sundays, but you mostly would only hear it once because it's assigned for um, late in Epiphany Tide, or late in Epiphany Tide, which is um, sometimes gets cut off if Lent is early, and then so then it's also um, early in the Pentecost season or in the Green season, and sometimes that gets cut off if Easter is late. And uh, but then you'd hear it in the kind of probably fall, and somewhere in October is usually when we would read the psalm. And uh, it's a it's a wisdom psalm. And so this is kind of a, a new, you know, kind of a, a new genre for us. It's, it's a wisdom psalm that does touch on the subjects of the individual lament, but that we've been reading a lot of. Um, but it kind of comes at it from a different sort of um, theological angle. And so the, 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 the lament of the psalmist theology and the wisdom tradition, which normally are kind of live in two separate worlds, right? Sometimes, you know, the wisdom tradition, for example, when I say wisdom, what I mean are like, for example, the book of Proverbs, the, book, the wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, you know, those, those books of the Bible are, you know, possess their own theology. But, uh, you know, in a sense, in, in the life of Israel, the various theologies meet in the worship of the temple, as so often happens. Our, our worship and our hymnody and our kind of service music, if you will, is a place where theologies kind of come together to be synthesized. Um, and so, so it happened in the, the uh, has kind of wisdom took up the themes of the lament. Because so, like the individual, so what I mean by that is that the individual lament, of course, is often, con you know, concerned with the wicked, those nasty wicked, and what they're up to, and how they're, you know, bothering me, and God, can't you do something about that? And, uh, um, and, uh, and the wisdom tradition is, is really interested in, kind of a, you know, to give you a thumbnail sketch, but the wisdom tradition is really interested in reflecting upon the way the world works as God has made it. Kind of the assumption of the wisdom tradition is kind of a creational monotheism, and it's kind of God has made the world with various laws and principles that are accessible to human reason. The kind of if we just reflect on it, and when when we mean reflect on it, we ask, we ask what did what did the rabbis of old say about it? You know, it's kind of like wisdom is something which, by the very nature of the case, is is handed down, is traditioned. You know, and especially in the biblical, now, of course, this is hard for us as moderns because it's the total opposite for us. As moderns, that which is old is old, is out. You know, it's like, it's like it doesn't have any relevance. There's no applica applicability to, you know, it's like it's all about the new. And, um, but in the ancient world, that which was old was privileged in terms of being a source of knowledge. And uh, so that, that's why in some ways you had these funny little kind of uh, gymnastics where the early Christian fathers, the earliest apologists of the church, went to great lengths. It's, it's somewhat comical to read it now, but for that, they were absolute, in absolute earnest where they tried to prove that basically Plato got all his best stuff from Moses. And they tried to, you know, with this, because so if they could prove that Moses came before Plato and Aristotle, then they got their stuff from Moses and therefore even the Greeks, you know, acknowledged the wisdom of the, you know, the word of God. And so they went through a whole lot of trouble, um, which again, we don't even bother, you know, in seminary, you come across that stuff, but, you know, it, it moderns, we just like, what's the big deal? So what if it's, you know, later, um, it's, it, it's better, right? It's two, version 2.0, that's better than 1.0. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the prejudice of wisdom. But again, wisdom wants to know how does the world work? What are the principles by which those who would be the people of God should live in their daily lives as they negotiate kind of life's uh, frequently occurring situations? You know? So wisdom is very prudential. It's very pragmatic. It's kind of like, how do you get along in this life? And um, now wisdom doesn't have a whole lot of interest necessarily in an eschatological future. 
And it's wisdom is that is to say, wisdom is how you negotiate this situation in the here and now uh, to the with the greatest success. Now the laments, as we've read, the laments all are very interested in a future, you know, writing of the you know writing of the world. The, the, the laments look forward to a future doing of justice by God. So you have these two very different traditions that come together in Psalm 37. I wanted to read for you um, to, because it's it's one of the it's one of the places where uh, Augustine's sermons are is, is more accessible, and uh, in some ways really touches on why this psalm is so interesting, or in many ways is so interesting to us, or I think it ought to be interesting. Um, and uh, and so this is got he preached a sermon um, outside of his home city in Carthage. Or, or his home city was Hippo. He preached in Carthage, which was kind of the metro, the metropole. That's where the archbishop uh, lived, the patriarch lived. And um, we happen to know that um, Saint Fulgentius uh, was was converted to the monastic life by hearing Augustine preach on this psalm uh, and this sermon. But so this is a paragraph. This is one of his introductory paragraphs before he gets in the verse by verse commentary. Uh, Augustine says, This it is that disturbs you who are a Christian, that you see men of bad lives prospering and surrounded with abundance of things like these. You see them sound in health, distinguished with proud honors. You see their family unvisited by misfortune, the happiness of their relatives, the obsequious attendance of, of their dependents, their most commanding influence, their life uninterrupted by any sad event. You see their characters most profligate, their external resources most affluent. And your heart says that there is no divine judgment, that all things are carried to and fro by accidents and blown about in disorderly and irregular motions. For if God, thou sayest, regarded, regardest human affairs, would his iniquity flourish and my innocence suffer? Every sickness of the soul hath in scripture its proper remedy. Let him then whose sickness is of that kind, that he says in his heart things like these, let him drink this psalm by way of potion. So this is, in, a, is a, in short, Augustine says, when, you, when you're worried about the, the injustices of the world, um, this is the psalm for you. So if you, uh, you know, if you're bothered by the apparent injustice of the world, that this is a psalm that like a, and he, he, he draws out that, it, you know, a potion for the soul. And it's like, he's kind of like the, the physician that's I'm mixing something here for you and you can drink it down and it'll, you'll feel much better in the morning. Um, so uh, getting into the, uh, the psalm itself, um, I'm going to lead you through the structure because it's a little bit different from psalms that we've seen before. And, in some ways, uh, the you know the um, what we've called the provocation or the problem does appear like an individual lament. It's appearing right in the beginning at verse one, um, and which is uh, the problem actually though is not the wicked per se. The problem is fretting about the wicked. See, that's that's the that's the wisdom difference. The, you know, so the lament is all about the wicked are the problem in the world. Wisdom wants to say, oh, no, no, no. The problem is you fretting about the wicked. <laughs> so you see the difference? So it's all about fretting. And you have that word repeated in verses 1, verses 7, and verse 8, down in verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way. And then in verse 8. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. So the, uh, the, the, the goal of the psalmist here is, in a sense, to lead you a you deal with them, which is you fretting or worrying about God. If there's in the what of the person world just going to hand what's God's not that be the case because 
and it is interesting where is that the end of for the fairly suffering the system say suffering is going to come right you know it's like so it's like that's just there in the world the the difference is how we're going to respond to that okay so then it has a commentary on which is kind of a prelude of what will be the 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 posture towards the wicked throughout the whole psalm. They will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Um, so it's the idea of the wicked are, you know, basically they're transitory. And so therefore that's the, that's kind of the, that supplies the moral force of the psalmist argument. That is, don't fret yourself or get yourself all in a dither and get yourself basically into a position where you begin to lack faith over that which is transitory, that which is passing away, that which has no sub, you know, no substantial, um, you know, no, in a sense, nothing substantial about it. It fades away. It's going to go away. So that's the, that, you know, in verses one through two, you essentially have kind of a preview of the theme of the whole psalm. So if the problem is fretting, then verses three through eight provide the remedy. And so this is where I'll, so now I'll get uh, just a little bit Socratic. So now, so what is the remedy? So if, if fretting is the problem, what's the solution according to the psalmist? Trusting in the Lord. Yeah, good. <laughs> Trusting in the Lord and taking delight in him. So you'll have a whole bunch of formulations of from verses three through eight of various you know, ways of saying trust in the Lord and do good. So again, being it's being Semites, it's not it's not enough to have a good attitude. <laughs> the Semites is like, okay, you start with the attitude. But that attitude better manifest in some, you know, worldly, you know, kind of manifestations. You know, it better, it better come out in, in behaviors. Um, so the Semites, you know, it's like, trust in the Lord, step one. Step two, do good. Right? And so there is a faith, and then there is a behavioral response to that faith, which is doing good. So that you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, this is something that, uh, that Augustine raises, and, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing to address with how the desires of the heart are different from what we may think of the desires of the heart might be, right? So we, we think of the desires of our hearts, we tend to think of kind of a more romantic or sentimental or kind of, um, well you know, selfish, frankly, you know, what is the desire of your heart? Name the desire of your heart. And the, again, we have to remember that the, in the, in the Israelite anthropology, the, the heart is the place of considered decision and commitment. So you know, the design, the desire of your heart isn't what feels good, right? It's not, that's not, that in the Bible would be called the flesh, <laughs> so that, so it's like, what feels good is the flesh. Um, that's thinking with the flesh. It's not the desires of the flesh. It's the desires of the heart. Again, meaning your commitment to follow the ways of God. And so essentially what the psalmist is saying, if you take delight in the Lord, he will give you that which you are seeking. That is a relationship with God that results in one's, you know, kind of blessedness and peace. So that's the, that's the goal. So that's the desires of the heart. It's a, in a sense, it's a properly formed um, conscience is, is what's at stake here, which, again, wisdom is all about properly forming our wants and expectations. Right? So it's the desires of the heart. It's like you have to have it. And so, again, and Jesus says, you know, blessed are the pure in heart. You know, so, and what, and again, what that, what that means is, it, is it pure in heart is sometimes, you know, kind of seen to be, especially with, you know, you know, kind of American evangelicalism, kind of a, a kind of moral naivete, 
<laughs> you know, oh, bless their hearts. They just don't know any better. You know, it's a, and, but that's not what the pure in heart. Pure in heart means a total dedication and commitment of the self to the doing of God's will. That's the pure in heart, right? It's, in a sense, it's unalloyed like a metal, like, you know, like gold or silver, which again is one of the metaphors used in the prophetic literature. The refined silver. I will refine you as silver is refined. Seven times refined. So um, is the pure in heart are those who have a totally unalloyed commitment to God's way. And of course, Jesus unfolds that as a way of self-gift and mercy and love. So that's what he's saying about the pure in heart. It's not just the morally naive. Um, so it's, it, it, ta- it's, it's, it takes a little more kind of... Um, militancy than that <laughs> so now jesus is uh, you know like come on folks we got a mission so the commit your way to the lord trust in him and he will act he will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like noonday so the so we kind of have this um the 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 promise when we commit to god that god will act and so the psalmist here is is of course affirming that our life is a gift from God, that we live our lives at God, in God's grace, as a gift from God. So, you know, it's like, it's a counterbalance to do, you know, go out there and do good, but it's also, in a sense, we're doing good so that God will act, or in a sense, our, God is acting through our doing good. The two are in a, in a, are in a synergy or in a relationship with each other, a reciprocal relationship of our doing and God's acting. Okay, so God parts the waters of the Red Sea, but the Israelites have to walk through it. So that's, that's the partnership um, that God has with humanity. Uh, and he will make your vindication shine light, like, and the justice of your cause, like the noonday, and of course, in the as we as followers of Jesus, we see these um, these images has has strong images of resurrection faith, right? That the when we is shining like light, the noonday, um, our vindication. This is all is talking about re- being on resurrection ground. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices like the devices and desires of our own hearts, as uh, we say in our morning prayer confession. Um, Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. So here's a question for the group. So what kind of evil, in a sense, does fret, could fretting lead to in the, in the world, in the world of the psalmist? What would, what would be some of that evil? Desire for revenge, desire for action to take revenge. Right, good, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, again, and especially if it's in a disordered way, right? You know, it's like the wisdom literature would say, uh, don't go overboard on trying to get back at somebody. That's, uh, you know, you're going to wind up getting even more trouble. Uh, uh, Randy. Envy, it's just being here, just become envious. Right, good. So, you know, you're fretting, it's like, oh man. And so envy, in a sense, can lead to an adoption of their strategy. It's like, boy, they really do have it good, don't they? Maybe I ought to, you know, maybe I ought to get in on that action. And, you know, so that, that you know, if you start worrying about how well, and Augustine himself actually raises that point in his sermon, that, you know, if you start really, um, in a sense, uh, almost in a backhanded way, admiring the wicked and how well they're doing, it's a very strong temptation to then adopt their methods. Um, so yes, absolutely good, Randy. Um, uh, Jenny, um, paying back a false witness by giving a false witness. Okay, right. So kind of again, paying in kind. Um, in kind of playing the rules, uh, playing the game by their rules. Good. What else? Um, I think that it, it's self-destruction because the, the, that kind of fretting leads to, the, you destroy your own health and your own mind. So you're actually destroying what God has given you. 
Right. Good. Yes, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, specifically, I'd say that, you know, in a sense, um, and the, the temptation to despair, right. And, it, you know, that, 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 you know, you can either be envious or you can simply despair and say, it's just, there's no use. There is no use in trying anymore, being a moral person or trying to follow God's ways anymore. And so that fretting, that worrying can lead to um, either despair or even more uh, alarming to Augustine and to other moral theologians to um, a place where you're really fundamentally questioning God's ju justice and goodness. It's like, it's like, wow, you know, if that's the way it is, well, maybe God's not cracked you know, all that he's cracked up to be. Uh, and that's a very dangerous place uh, to be, spiritually speaking. Um, so, uh, yes, so that it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Now, again, the uh, Jesus in his Beatitudes See, there, there's, some, there's some real connections between this psalm and the Beatitudes of Jesus that, in the, you know, that they shall inherit the kingdom of God, right? And, you know, that, that when Jesus uses that language of inheritance, you know, um, come into the inheritance of my father. You know, it's like, come, you know, that when Jesus uses that language, he's using psalmist language. And in a sense, relocating the hope from... Uh, the land of, you know, being Israel, right, and inherit the land. Again, the, you know, the, the, the even in the time of the psalmist, the, an inheritance of the land would have been already a metaphor that, that came from Israel's early experience as a nomadic people. I mean, what do, what do ranchers want? They want grazing land, you know, and they don't want anybody to have their, their flocks on it. You know, it's like it's mine. It's for my sheep, not your sheep. So, for uh, to inherit the land for a nomadic kind of grazing people, uh, that is is uh, like the highest prize. That's life, you know, because your flocks eat the grass on the land, and then you, you get what comes out of your flocks. Um, but by the time of the psalmist in First Temple Judaism. Again, the, the, they'd been settled on that land. The land was now a monarchy um, with lots of, uh, actually lots of mercantilism uh, had being on a part of that royal road from, you know, that, that went from the Fertile Crescent, you know, basically being a part of the, the land connected to the Crescent into the Nile, and they were right there in between. So... Uh, they had shifted, which there was a lot of anxiety about that. So the land itself becomes, in a sense, a metaphor for the home place. You know, it's like, you know, kind of the motherland. But then Jesus, in in his thing about the kingdom of God, shifts that expect into one that's focused on a relationship with God that transcends ethnic and boundaries. And, and that's what's open. That in a sense, the kingdom of God can be in the end because you don't have to move there. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's you know, you, you don't have to kind of keep on, you know, you don't have to stack houses up because the kingdom of God is a relationship with the creole things, not a piece of real estate, like human kingdoms. Human kingdoms are defined by lines on a map, but the kingdom of God is defined by a relationship that strikes to the very core of the human person. So to inherit the land is about, you know, in a sense, another way to put it is the New Jerusalem, right? You know, as a, you know, from, as a Christian perspective, that we, as we read Psalms, we can kind of insert in our, in our head as we kind of read them and pray them, that whenever we see these sorts of promises, like inheriting the land, we can kind of in our heads think, um, that the wicked shall be cut off, those who wait for shall inherit the new Jerusalem. Says so they'll, they'll be brought into it, um, has their own. Uh, so that's the promise. So verses three through eight again, you have a, uh, the, the remedies described, the remedy of trust. And then verse nine starts, an, uh, in a sense, it's an introduction, kind of, 
to the next kind of material that we have, which is classic wisdom. So verses 9 through 22 is a classic form of wisdom in which we're going to have a long series of comparisons between the wicked and the righteous. So again, this is very different from the laments. Right? Lament absolutely focus on the here's what the wicked are doing and why they're mad and and the particular in which they're oppressing me. Uh, and God, you know, here's some here's some suggestions about what to do about. Um, but these are really, in a sense, again, these compare contrast between the righteous and the wicked. So, um, kind of to open it up again. So as we go through this, what are some of these, how are these, some of these comparisons, you know, as they, they, as they strike you, what are some things that kind of jump out? You know, I say like, for example, when I say a comparison, I mean like, for example, you'll have a unit, will say, get a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. That ties back to the introduction, you know, to the meek shall inherit. Who said something like that about the meek inheriting something? See, see what I'm saying? So the meek shall inherit the land and themselves in abundant prosperity. So you see what I'm saying about there? That's the comparison. So from nine, for basically, or nine is a bridge, but from 10 to 22, have a whole string of these, a pearl string of comparisons. So what are some, some of these comparisons that, that leap out at you or are particularly powerful? I think the one where he's saying uh, in verse 14 and 15 about mm -hmm. them Find the bars and bringing down the poor and the needy, and not only is God going to act against them, but they're they're also generating their own self destruction. Their sword sh sword shall enter their own heart. Right. Exactly, and so that's a we've seen for in become their traps. Again. And guess the way he says, control goes about. I was like, what? They draw. So, a or is this open hostage, whereas Ben was some kind of spiritual skin against you secretly. And, uh, works you know you know because we know that's but you know some people come at you uh, as or you know try to destroy from behind your back like they're you know like they're running, and they kind of come up on them all, and they bend their bow ready to you know, so uh, it's a of um down on the port game ball. You're gonna uh, their hunter uh, their own minds, but ultimately yes, and that's so just gonna turn right around. Be careful do this done with it. Mother told you not to run with swords. Um they can pierce heart uh, uh, yeah. Of laughing, the is like a movie. The this image of the Lord is unusual. It <laughs> is. You're right. You're right. It's and very unlike wisdom literature. But this is wisdom literature picking up that good old Semitic anthropomorphization of the Creator God. 
And, you know, the God who walks in the Garden of Eden at the cool of the day looking like, Adam, where are you? It's like, he's gone. It's like, you know, like, he does, why, why would he need to call out for Adam? He could just like go straight to him, right? It's like, bing, he's there. He, boop, he appears. But God is like looking for him. Where are you? And, you know, so it's this, there's this wonderful Semitic um, kind of familiarization of God, right? And so God laughs at the wicked. It's like, ha, 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 you silly wicked people. Um, so absolutely. So it's this, this description of that very human and again, you're right. God does not laugh uh, very frequently, and but he, but when he does, it's kind of like the most interesting man in the world. But when God does laugh, it's at the wicked. So, uh, <laughs> right, um, and he sees that their day is coming. So it's like he can, and it, and so here it's a, you know says yes. So on the one hand, he's very, it's kind of this very humanistic image of God. But on the other hand, we have to remember God is also omnipotent. And he sees the future in a way that we human beings cannot. And he knows exactly what's going to happen to them. It's like he knows they're, you're, they're steering right for the pothole. And they're going to go right into it. Um, and he can see it happen a long ways away. And um, in some ways, this is to trust in the Lord who sees that the day of the wicked is coming is part of that anti-fretting attitude. And it says that the, the, although we humans can't see it, we trust in a Lord who sees it and in a sense is bringing it to pass. Uh, that the, the, so for the Lord to see something mean, means he's going to make sure that it happens. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't be able to see it. Right? So um, the logic of omnipotence works that way. So if the Lord sees it, it means he's bringing it about. And so we trust that he will do so even when we can't see it or bring it about ourselves. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, and, all, and, and also the, uh, on verse uh, 15 of the sword piercing or entering their own heart, um, Augustine makes the point that while the, the wicked are, um, can attack the flesh of the righteous, you know, they can harm their bodies and take their goods, they can't touch the heart. You know, the, and but what's going to get it, what's going to be harmed with the wicked well not their bodies because they're sleek and sound and they're feasting in sumptuous purple robes so it's not but it's their heart is what's going to be um attacked in their through their own wickedness and so it's that contrast he draws that contrast between that the fate of the wicked and the righteous good who else yeah jane Um, in 21 and 22, it goes back to that, the responsibility of taking care of the, the widows and the poor. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. Mm -hmm. And then in 22, it kind of puts him, puts God back in that kind of human action because those cursed by him will be cut off. Right. They're laying right. So. taken away. And indeed, and so again, in the now this metaphor, you know, knowing the, the metaphor, in a sense that you know, kind of entering into that relationship with God in the New Jerusalem, in a sense, if you you know that the wicked are are you know are disqualify themselves for being in a relationship with a God who is just. Um, yeah, you have some proverbial wisdom here, um, you know, it, which is very. This is something very close to a saying that we would see in the Book of Proverbs. The wicked borrow and do not pay back, but the righteous are generous and keep on giving. Um, that's proverbial wisdom. Uh, you have a proverbial saying um, in verse 16, better is a little that the righteous person has than the abundance of many wicked. Um, again, that's just classic proverbial wisdom, but now in a sense set to song. Um, and... Uh, you know, so it's kind of uh, the sayings of the, of the people, of kind of their moral, their moral truisms, but now set in a much deeper context um, because they've been included. In worship. I mean, you can imagine how it would be a, just a saying that you pass on from, you know, parent to child, you know, wicked borrow and they don't pay back, but the righteous will keep on giving. Um, you know, it's like, you know, this is you know, kind of a just so story. Almost. And, um, but now it's given theological depth by being placed in the context of Israel's uh, worship and hope for justice. Who else? Any other? Hmm. 
Okay. Well, so um, in a sense, the uh, and again, the if twenty, you have something where um, is very. This is very similar to the Psalms of Lament. The wicked perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the glory of the pastures, they vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Um, and uh, again, this, as I, I think, is, Augustine was particularly inspired uh, in when preaching because some of the ser- I mean, some of the sermons I've been working through are, are, are frankly a little, a little dry. Um, as he goes, verse verse, probably a lot like this experience. But um, he also, but he says um, in verse twenty. You know, about the smoke that vanished away, he has this really great insight about how, you know, when you notice, he says, notice where the, what happens to the smoke when it rises from a flame. It, when it gets higher and higher, it's dispersed and more ephemeral and dissipates. And he says, you know, the way as they are proud and they're vaunted up in their pride, they wind up getting, you know, the bigger they get, since the less substantial they are, it was a, it's a great. It was a, I thought it was a very witty um, insight into kind of smoke and applying that to the wicked and how it is that they would dissipate. Um, you know, and just like that, that's, that works for me. That's a that's a good. That, that, I'll preach, um, and evidently it did. Um, so then, in verses twenty three through twenty nine we have um, what would be very recognizable from our Psalms of Lament, which would be a confession of faith. You know, so essentially, that, so now that we've talked about this comparison between the righteous and the wicked, it's time to confess our faith. Um, so this whole section is, again, an expression of, of that faith that we're called to have. In God. So, as you read this uh, this confession of faith, what se- what's what's most uh, what is uh, kind of something that blesses you, or or that you um, find uh, particularly meaningful in that section from verses twenty three to twenty nine. The children being cut off. Where is that? But the right oh. will be kept safe, however, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Oh, yes. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yes, indeed. So. Right. Oh, that's, so that's up in, I'm sorry. So that's up in the, uh, yeah, that was comparisons. Right. Yes. Well, so, uh, right. So, the, uh, yeah, we're, so we're like, we're looking at the, 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 the verses 23 through 29 of the, the confessions of faith um, as we go through. And uh, let's see, Erica, you you raising your hand or yeah, yeah. Um, the the verse twenty five really struck me, where the psalmist is saying, mm. "I've been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken." I, I just think that's that's mm. very comforting, and it's very bolstering to say, you know. I've seen it. God has done it. You know, even if you're not just mm. taking it right on faith, I'm telling you I've seen it. Right. Right. Good. And I so now that I give this time of training you to see this to be Augustinian and read the Psalms. So what do you Augustine did with uh, what we say would be verse twenty five C where the, the righteous are not forsaken or their children taking bread? What do, you, what, do you, what do you think Gus would have done with that? So remember that Augustine is reading this through an ecclesiastical lens. You know what's confusing is verses don't always line up. So I think uh, the numbers that you're saying line up, I just I have the same question as you the book of prayer, the prayer, the, the verse don't line up either. So it's a little bit. So the verse 25 doesn't line up. Verse 25 is. I've been young and I'm old, but I have not seen the righteous. The book of prayer, stumble, they should fall headlong for the Lord holds in the hand. Huh. Oh, 
offer in my transition. We sometimes get confused, and I think like that we we don't have this person. We don't bring because it's different. But it's interesting. some other verses that folks kind of um, find meaningful. So Jenny, yeah. What is that? In, okay, so in verse 28 that Randy was that, that Randy was talking about, the Lord loves justice, but he will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children. Oh, the children are the wicked people. Oh, that's where he was. Okay, gotcha. I'm sorry, Randy. I thought you were dead at verse 22, but you were you were right. You're in uh, verse 28. Yeah, it, it, my mistake. I just was uh, I was still in that uh, that first slip version of it, right? Um, so again, this is all this is about a future that is you know again it's an es this is bringing in that eschatological future where the 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 righteous shall be kept safe forever, but the children of the wicked, meaning, and again. Children, this doesn't necessarily mean those under the age of 18, but rather kind of their disciples, you know, that, that they're, you know, their followers. Um, and uh, they, that they will, again, they will not be brought into that new Jerusalem. The righteous shall inherit the land. There's that, again, that key metaphor that runs through the whole psalm um, and live in it forever. So it's this, uh, it's the promise of, an eternal life with uh, with God in in a kind of in God's kingdom in the land that God has promised. Um, good. What else? Where's Charmaine? Are you? Oh, you're uh, muted. I know. Okay. Oh, sorry. I think you were about to allude to it. Mm -hmm. Whatever verse one twenty five is, um, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. I'm, I'm willing to bet that Augustus. When I first saw that, I, um, I'm pretty sure there's some some children of the righteous that have had to beg for bread at some point. And, Indeed, yes. And so I, I would think Augustus would address that issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that definitely is subject to interpretation. Right. And uh, uh, right. So again, it's in, in, the, the, in the wisdom tradition, right? In the wisdom tradition uh, assumes a, a fairly straightforward theodicy. That is a, a, very, a fairly straightforward doctrine of evil. That is... You know, the Lord will eventually make things come out right, in very, but very much in this life, right? In a sense, you know, so you, if, if you behave in the right ways, the, uh, an outcome, you know, you'll have a good outcome. And um, that's why in some ways in the life of Israel, as it gets brought into the, in, out of the wisdom philosophical context into the life of Israel, uh, the religious life of Israel, it has to be, in a sense, pushed out into the eschatological, that is, in, you know, into the resurrection. And that's where you get that language of um, verse 28 about the Lord not forsaking his faithful ones or his saints. The righteous will be kept safe forever. The righteous shall inherit the land and live in it forever. So it kind of, it pushes back. So this is, in a sense, that the 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 resurrection hope of Israel, which is kind of pushing against the wisdom tradition, and the two are kind of in a an unresolved tension, 
within the psalm itself. Um, because in a sense, you're right. It, it, it would seem like that would be, if we're even talking about the wicked in the first place, then it would seem like uh, the observation of verse 25 would be easily falsifiable. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, that would be easy to falsify unless it is more, it becomes more of a, a proverbial or philosophical commitment to in ult- the kind of the ultimate disposition of the righteous and their offspring. Well, I have a question. I have a question. I, I've noticed, who is the I? Who is I? I have never seen that because it, occasionally mm-hmm. we're getting, I have seen, Occasionally you come into the first person, but who is I? Aha, uh-huh. yes. Well, the I changes. It? Right. So the I in uh, verse 25 is kind of a, the kind of the proverbial observer, you know, kind of the, kind of the, 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 the wise observer of the, you know, of the human condition in light of God's providence. But we'll get to who the I is. So in, in 35, the I is different. Um, and we will, we will get there. So in verses 30 through 33, we have more comparison units, right? You know, the, some more pairings. So, and again, if the, the psalm is like, if you do it once, do it a couple times, do it a dozen times, just to make sure that, you know, put in everything you can think of um, to compare the righteous versus uh, the wicked. Um, so what are some of the things in this comparison that kind of stand out to you versus 30 through 33? It, it all seems like it's in future tense, because if, you, if you're reading what's going on there, you can't say that you know, there's always justice for the wis- <laughs> for the wise. So this mm-hmm. is more like a description of the future, even the idea of children not having to beg for bread. It's happening now, but it won't happen then. Yes, right. Mm-hmm. So the your so the tone of the psalm begins to shift, or the 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 the, the psalm begins to shift its theological emphasis from the present. Um, to the future. So you have um, uh, the, the, the wicked watch for the righteous seek to kill them. The Lord will not abandon them to their power or let them be condemned when they are brought to trial. And so in verse 34, you have, again, the, in a sense, the, the pairing of that. So now as we move to the future, so if, if justice is pushed to the future, then what is the new uh, what is the new virtue that is required of the righteous in verse 34? Patience. Yes, exactly. Patience. Wait for the Lord and keep to his way. So, and, that, and that's what becomes, again, privileged in both the life of Israel and, in the, and also in the early church, right? So what does St. Saint, Saint Paul say? Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces patience, and patience produces character, and character produces hope, and our hope does not disappoint us. Uh, so uh, is is that the virtue of patience becomes the necessary virtue for an eschatological hope? Um, so you have to. We need now. We need to wait for the Lord to keep and keep to His way, so that He will exalt us to inherit the land and look on the destruction of the wicked. Uh, so, right, so you have a shifting of, of that. So now, so now, so again, so as, the, as the psalm has changed its tone uh, partway through, so the, you know, in a sense, the, the, wisdom, the wisdom outlook can only go so far. <laughs> it only gets you so far. And pretty soon you're gonna have to get, you're gonna have to get more into the classic Israelite hope. Um, and so then in, given that there's a problem and that now we need to wait for God to solve it in verse 35, you have, you know, guess who shows up on the scene? The I am, right? So this, this I is the I, it is the I am. 
And in a sense, what you now have breaking into the psalm has an interjection. You have a first-person interjection, and the voice of the Lord, in a sense, breaks into this rumination on, on you know, the righteous and the wicked and, and God's providence with, a, with direct speech. So in a sense, you get a prophetic interjection in this wisdom psalm. I have seen the wicked oppressing. This is like straight out of Exodus, like chapter three, right? I have seen the sufferings. I've heard their cries. This is it's like, it's almost like, okay, wisdom guys, it's time for the God of the Bible to show up. <laughs> you know? It's like, that's all that we can, we can be talking about these, you know, wonderful comparisons, but ultimately God is going to need to show up. I have seen the wicked oppressing and towering like a cedar of Lebanon. Again, I passed by and they were no more. Though I sought them, they could not be found. Which again, ties back to, as I said, remember how it, that verse two is that kind of, in the, the verse two of the Psalm is that prelude to the theme. And so now we're gonna wind up back at verse two, but now with God himself expressing the viewpoint of eternity. Whereas in verse two, it was more of a wisdom observation for they, sh sh they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. And now God says, yeah, I went, I, you know, they're gone. <laughs> you know, I, I'm in eternity and they're not here with me. Um, so mark the blameless. And, uh, and this, so again, this continues in verses, um, basically the, the voice of God continues through verse 38. Mark the blameless, behold the upright, for there is posterity for the peaceable. The transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked shall be cut off. Um, so again, there's that, a repeating image, repeating phrase. But again, now spoken as a word from the Lord, as a direct promise to the faithful who wait. Um, so if you're going to wait, you better have a word from the Lord uh, to do it. And then the psalm ends... Um, again, what, with what in, in a confession of faith in verses 39 through 40, with, with, which is what, what is really, you know, if you're making notes in your Bible, you, you can kind of bracket this. Psalm 39 and, and 40 really, in my judgment, uh, expresses the fundamental faith of the Psalter. I mean, it, I mean this, is, this is the faith of the, psalm, of, of the psalmist has kind of overall has, you know, the whole oeuvre, the whole thing. Um, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. That's, that's a summary of the posture of the faithful. That is, that is, the, that is the creed of the psalmist. It's kind of like, you know, it's just we, as we do the Nicene, this is, this is the equivalent of the Apostles' Creed for the psalmist. Um, this is what we, in a sense, we stake our lives on, is that the salvation of the righteous is from uh, the Lord, and the Lord's helping them um, and rescuing them um, and saving them. So it's a, you know, it's this kind of triumphant ending. But if, again, I just want to point out, you know, in some ways that this really encapsulate, encapsulates the whole thing. And, and again, you can see why, you know, again, as, as I also try to point out that this is why I wanted to do 37, even though the first 12 verses are on a Sunday, because it, it really does, it really seems to be very much in the echo or that, that uh, you know, in the background of the Beatitudes themselves. You know, this, this repeated notion of, 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 of the meek and the, those, you know, the righteous and inheriting the kingdom of God and then, you know, this is all just so... You know, it's there. It's an echo. Um, it may not be, you know, Jesus may not be quoting from it directly, but it's, it's so much a part of the idiom, the biblical idiom with which the people of Israel spoke that Jesus doesn't have to quote it. He can just speak in its, it, 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 I guess another, I guess a way to put it would be, um, you know, for those of you who know the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, right? And how, how Lincoln's speeches are given in the cadences and the diction of the King James version of the Bible that he learned to read with. And I mean, he just spoke that way. It was just part of who he was. And in a sense, in the same way, Jesus was speaking 
in the cadences of the Psalter, you know, in the language of the prayer book of his people. Um, yeah, uh, Jenny. Um, in 38, that, that you were with the, um, in the last little section, mm -hmm. so the transgressors sh shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Is that basically repeating um, just what he said back in 28? The, right, yeah. the Lord loves justice, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Right, or and in verse 22. Yep, so it's like it's three times it really means it. Um, you know, so yeah. Um, but now much more um, you have that, uh, you know, that again, the posterity or the future, the, uh, the eternity of the wicked. And so again, you have with God from the God, the God's eye point of view, whereas before it's stated from the perspective of the psalmist who is pondering the human experience of moral providence. And now is kind of God saying, yeah, this, this is, this is the deal. Um, right. All right. Good. Well, that's a, a good little Psalm. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, we won't be, uh, I'm, I'm giving myself, I'm a slacker. So I'm going to take Easter off. So, I, you know, because um, I know you would all be here, that you're, you have nothing to do, and you, that you, that's not a big day for dinners or anything like that. And you would love nothing better than to be here at 5 to 6 o'clock. But I'm going to dismiss class next week, and we'll come back uh, the second Sunday of Easter at 5 o'clock. And um, I, do, I will just to be looking out for uh, a new Zoom invite, because I've gone through seven classes by then, so I'm going to renew the Zoom invite, um, so don't assume you'll be able to click this link and get, get in, so just look from that from the church um, as we send that out, and we'll be doing, um, we'll be continuing, we'll go do Psalms uh, 38 and 39 um, at that point, so uh, um, all right, well, have a blessed Holy Week, everybody. And uh, I'll be, I suppose I'll be seeing some of you anyway, between now and the big, the big day, uh, seven days hence. So take care, everybody. God bless.